Welcome to Oncology Today, Novel Agents and Strategies in Ovarian Cancer. This is medical oncologist Dr. Neil Love. I met with Dr. Deborah Richardson from the OU Health Stevenson Cancer Center in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. In addition to this interview, there's also a corresponding video program featuring Dr. Richardson's slide presentation. To begin, she commented on recently presented data from the Destiny Pan Tumor O2 study of trastuzumab deruxtecan in patients with a variety of HER2-expressing solid tumors. I'm still enthusiastic about antibody drug conjugates. Uh, I think that, you know, we only have one so far. I think that's a, a large, you know, potential. Um, and I kind of briefly mentioned that last case, you know, with HER2 new or ERB2. Um, you know, there isn't that much high expression, but now with more potent antibody drug conjugates, we're seeing efficacy. And so one of the most exciting things to me was the destiny trial at ASCO where it was, that was the basket trial, you know, and you could be one plus, two plus, three plus, her two. And we actually saw the highest response rates in, you know, mostly in the GYN cancers, including ovarian cancer. So I think TDXD might have a role for, uh, those patients potentially as well. Um, as far as other treatments, I'm curious to see how the relicorolent is, is going to do. Um, there's also nembalukin. So that's where we're looking at the kind of immuno, novel immunotherapy, uh, trial. Um, there definitely are some bispecifics that may be exciting as well. You know, we have not figured out how to harvest the immune system for ovarian cancer. And to me, that's like the biggest thing we need to figure out. How do we get patients with ovary cancer to get an immunologic response? How can we see some of the responses that we've seen in uterine cancer and cervix cancer? And of course, melanoma, you know, many other solid tumors. We just have not been successful with immunotherapy and ovary cancer. So I'd really love to see us figure that out um, and bring some of those therapies forward for our patients. You uh, mentioned a TDXD and, of course, now being used in HER2 low breast cancer. And as you say, now we're starting to see responses in many different places, including the data uh, from ASCO. Have you actually used it in any patients with gynecologic cancers? I have not given TDXD, but I've given a similar ADC um, in our phase one unit to uh, endometrial cancers. We have an ongoing phase one trial right now uh, enrolling endometrial cancer. And I would say just about every patient we put on that trial has had a PR. Not everyone, but the majority. But yeah, I personally I have not gotten... This. I heard a couple, of, uh, I think about a year ago, a couple of oncologists in, in, in you know, community practice who had tried it in gynecologic cancers and they saw responses. Of course, they have a lot of experience from breast, now lung and uh, GI cancers. And you mentioned a couple of times the issue of ILD uh, in some of the antibody drug conjugates that you were talking about. And of course, that's been a big issue um, with uh, TDXD. The breast cancer people are very aggressive about looking for ILD. They do preemptive imaging on these patients frequently, although it doesn't seem like, you know, lung and GI does it quite as much. Any thoughts about how you're going to approach uh, screening for ILD if, if and when you see a patient you're able to use uh, TDXD? I mean, I would definitely use CT chest, uh, and I would probably do it every three cycles you know, with my CAT scan, I'm in pelvis. That's typically how I manage my patients in standard of care is three cycles and then image and certainly have a low threshold if they're having any symptoms to get a CT scan of the chest. I think the good news is G1 oncologists have become more um, familiar with pneumonitis and, and uh, recognizing it and diagnosing it. It was not something we had to worry about very much until recently. <laughs> Hey, we didn't have to worry about ophthalmic issues until fairly recently. We we did an entire CME program just on ophthalmologic complications of oncology drugs, believe it or not. I never thought we would do that. Let me ask you something else, and you know, maybe you're going to tell me that this is something that's going by as well, but I was just kind of curious. I saw in your uh, CV um, some work you're doing on Prexacertib. It has a bunch of letters and names there. It sounds kind of interesting. What exactly is it? It uh, inhibits check one, two. Um, so basically cell cycle inhibition, you know, so kind of thinking about other um, cell cycle inhibitors. So uh, we're trying to develop the drug. 
Have you seen any responses with it? Uh, we have. It's usually given in combination with something else and not a uh, single agent. Right. So um, another thing you commented on in your talk was uh, tumor treating fields, which, as you mentioned, unfortunately, just saw a press release that in terms of the uh, primary endpoints or survival, that it's uh, not going to be adequate. Any thoughts about that strategy? Uh, I guess it's maybe not going to go too far. Uh, I guess in ovarian cancer, there was a positive phase three trial presented at ASCO and lung, although there it was uh, only effective when used with uh immunotherapy. Any thoughts about this strategy uh, and whether or not you see any future for it? So I think we only have seen the top line data that it failed to meet its primary endpoint in ovarian cancer. So I think we need a lot more data to um, kind of break it down. You know, is there a subgroup that potentially benefits, et cetera? I feel like we see this a lot in phase three trials where the phase two or, you know, phase ones look very promising and the later phase we get to the less response rates we see in the worse uh, meaning progression free and overall survival. But perhaps if it works better with immunotherapy and lung cancer, is there some kind of strategy there in ovary cancer? Um, quite frankly, at least standard checkpoint inhibitors don't work very well in ovarian cancer. So it may not be with IO by itself, or at least a checkpoint inhibitor, but what about a bispecific? You know, so if you could get a bispecific potentially with an anti-angiogenic plus um, something that targets anti-PD-1 or one of the other receptors that we could think about, TIGIT, things like that. I think we just have not figured out how to harvest the immune system and make it, make the, first of all, we need to alter the tumor microenvironment for ovarian cancer. And then we've <laughs> got to get the, you know, T lymphocytes to kill the ovarian cancer. That that strategy has not been very easy to figure out in ovarian cancer. But there may be some kind of bispecific or something else out there that's novel that will work maybe in combination with something else. And what's nice about the tumor treatment fields is, you know, there's some germ t side effects, but otherwise it seems to be, and it, it, I think it's probably a little bulky, right? People have to wear them, I believe, 22 out of 24 hours a day. But compared to some other side effects of systemic treatments we give, that's not so bad. So I don't know if there will be a, a um, way forward for tumor treatment fields in ovarian cancer. But perhaps, you know, depending on what the company finds, they, there may be some novel combinations to consider there. Yeah, we actually had a couple of patients uh, who were on that trial that we had presented, uh, I think it was at SGO, and uh, they... As you said, the main issue there was dermatologic, you know, the uh, leads uh, causing uh, derm dermatologic issues that once you stop it, uh, they kind of go away. So other than convenience, it seems like it was tolerated very well. Let me ask you another question. Somebody asked me something. I haven't heard about this drug in a long time, and it was asking me about this in ovarian. I was like, I don't know. Ixabibilone. Ah, so that made, <laughs> that now made it. I think I remember hearing that when I was a fellow or something. I don't know. I was like, where did that come from? Yeah, I feel like Ixabepilone is on the NCCN Compendia. Um, I feel like we used it actually in uterine cancer in GOG86P. Um, I have actually never given that drug because the patients I enrolled on that trial did not get randomized to that arm. Um, but recently we did talk about it briefly at a, um, a symposium at at SGO, but I have no experience using Ixabepilone. It is now, I believe, compendia listed. Do you know anything about it? Is it used as a single agent or It, it is single agent. Um, I would have to look it up, honestly. There's okay. so many well, yeah, options that are that are out there, and I, for the most part here, we put so many patients on clinical trial, I don't usually get to that line of therapy um, where I have to use something that I haven't used before in ovary cancer. Uh, another thing I saw on your uh, CV that, uh, again, I don't know how much interest you have or experience, but I just, uh, given the uh, carboplatin shortage, I noticed that you had this study looking at carboplatin clearance predictors. So that's, that um, yeah, so, you know, for in, in, it's an NRG study. And the thing is, we don't really know how to dose carboplatin. We just dose it as this area under the curve. Um, and... So it's unclear 
what doses are we actually giving the patients? Are we giving them what we intend to give them? It's never been systematically looked at. And so it's enrolling both men and women. It's actually closed to women enrolling because there's enough women. So trying to enroll men now, uh, male patients. Um, but the way that CARBO is calculated is using a GFR, you know, and their uh, creatinine, et cetera. And so it, we just want to know, are patients actually getting what we think they're getting? Or is there variation? If there's variation, how much? And is this the, what's the best way to dose carboplatin? Any comments? Of course, at ASCO, that was, we did 10 programs on different kinds of cancers. Almost every one, people were bringing up the chemo shortage and uh, GYN cancers was a hot way up on the list of concerns. I'm curious at your place what the situation is and what advice you give to practitioners who can't access carbo. And, and I've even heard not even be able to get cis platinum sometimes, but uh, what advice do you give people or what are you doing yourself? What's the situation where you are? Yeah, I mean, it's been actually pretty terrible. I never anticipated having these barriers as an oncologist of having shortages of of drugs that potentially are curative intent. Um, we did have a shortage of carboplatin. I'm happy to say that we have actually resolved that shortage and we've been able to remove the breaks from using carboplatin here uh, because for a while we had it very restricted. Uh, we also do have some cisplatin shortage, though, again, we're able to dose patients. Um, I will say that SGO came out with some guidance, so did ASCO. So uh, one of my recommendations to practitioners is looking to that ASCO guidance and the SGO guidance uh, because, you know, basically kind of broke down what are the alternatives, what are um, other regimens you can use. So oxaliplatin is an option as a third platinum. We do have some data in GYN cancers, though not a lot. Um, and it does have a little bit different side effect profile, has um, potentially some more neuropathy, uh, but that is an option. Um, and then just working with your pharmacist, uh, and there actually has been um, some help from the SGO as far as advocacy, but also reaching out. There's some organizations that were able to procure some uh, platinum, some carbo, and some cisplatin. So I actually did reach out to the SGO president, Dr. Angela Saccord, who put our institution in contact with um, some of these organizations, and then uh, Dr. Amanda Nichols-Fader as well. Both of them have some contacts if places are really struggling. There are places that seem to have um, good supplies, and so some people have sent their patients to some of the bigger academic centers that seem to have adequate supplies. What we were doing here was trying to be fair. Anybody who was cured of intent, we were trying to save the, you know, carboplatin or cisplatin, depending on what regimen they were getting, depending on what their disease was. So for ovary, it would obviously be carbo. We did try and keep everybody with cure of intent on carboplatin. We did dose reduce. So we took everybody down an AUC level. So if they were on six, we went to five. If they were on five, we went to four. We didn't go below four. But we did try and conserve uh, the what we had as much as possible. Uh, and we're also, we're upfront with patients about shortages and that they, we end up signing consents for <laughs> carboplatin or cisplatin. Yeah, I hear these stories all the time of, you know, talking about, you know, using, in, uh, using a curative situation, not curative. I, I just can't imagine discussing that with a patient. It's awful. You know, particularly somebody who you're, you know, somebody who's you, to be able to essentially communicate the idea that because you have metastatic disease, we're not going to be able to give you the treatment that we normally use. I, I just can't even imagine uh, how patients must uh, feel and, or and how physicians feel in that situation. Yeah, it's it's been one of the hardest things I think I've had to deal with in my career, quite frankly, because it was very frustrating. Um, and all I can hope is that our Congress can, you know, pass some legislation that would would make sure that these kinds of things don't continue to happen. Because, you know, I, if I'm not mistaken, there's over 15 drugs on, that are um, chemotherapies that are on the list. Even Taxol is potentially in, at risk of being in shortage. I'm curious, too, what your thoughts are in terms of next steps in terms of PARP inhibitors, uh, in terms of new uh, approaches, new thoughts, uh, uh, PARP after PARP, mechanisms of PARP resistance, uh, any thoughts or any research going on that uh, has you uh, interested and optimistic? 
mean, I think you just hit them. <laughs> you know, who should we use PARP in after PARP? We have minimal data. There was the Oreo trial, and it didn't look great, in my opinion, as far as reusing PARP maintenance on patients who had had prior PARP maintenance. However, I'm sure that there are some patients who are going to benefit, and I would really like to be able to know who they are. I can imagine if I had a BRCA patient who, um, you know, completed their PARP maintenance, had a long disease-free interval recurs and is platinum sensitive, and I'm going to re-challenge them with platinum that I would want to use a PARP inhibitor again. Uh, so I think there are going to be those patients. I think, you know, we have to, this is where there's some novel trial designs coming out, trying to identify, this is where I'm hoping we move to maybe uh, to circulating tumor DNA. That's not something that's really used much in GYN cancers at this point, and we don't have a lot of data, but I could see that being very helpful for to answer these questions, you know, do patients have they uh, developed BRCA reversion mutations? But what we know about PARP inhibitors are that the number one thing that predicts their sensitivity after you get off to the front line and they're, you know, if obviously if they're BRCA mutated, but after that, if they're platinum sensitive, that predicts potentially being sensitive to a PARP inhibitor, unless of course they progressed on a PARP inhibitor. Some of those patients are still platinum sensitive because uh, the mechanism of, react of resistance are not the same. But how do we identify who could do PARP alone? Who needs a PARP combo? And are there PARP combos that we can give that, number one, the drugs can be combined without overlapping toxicity and um, you know potentially restore PARP sensitivity? I'm very interested in those, you know, questions. And there are some smart people in our field working on those questions. And there there are some hopefully trials coming to try and answer some of that. You know, it could be a ATR inhibitor in combination with PARP. I think it may depend on what is your PARP resistance, you know, mechanism. We don't know what those are yet. You know, we don't have a way clinically of of knowing why was this person resistant to PARP. But hopefully we're going to get there. You know, I I heard about these reversion mutations. What's your vision of what that is? Uh, so they revert back to BRCA function. You know, so you can have inherited or somatic mutations, and then they revert back, and so now they are no longer homologous recombination deficient. They can repair their DNA through um, that <laughs> pathway. And you, you, this would could occur theoretically in people with germline mutations as well. It does happen. It's not hmm. common, but it it definitely can happen, and the tumor can be under, um, you know, pressure to uh, develop a reversion mutation, both from platinum and from PARP inhibitors. Um, you know, it's funny. You just as you were mentioning cell free DNA, I was writing it down here as a note to ask you about because. And like you said, in other solid tumors, you know, nonstop, when we do webinars, everybody's asking about uh, cell-free DNA. Uh, is it being looked at at all in gynecologic cancer? Is there any reason it wouldn't be uh, appropriate? I think it is being looked at. We just have limited data. Um, so I would like to see a lot more, you know, developed. And there's there's different companies that offer it. Uh, I certainly have sent it from time to time. In general, I think a lot of times for ovary cancer, we have plenty of tissue, uh, especially if somebody has an upfront debulking. So we tend to prefer tumor. Where I see it, you know, being useful is kind of, especially if you could follow it like um, over time, right? That's where cell free DNA would be very interesting. Like, first of all, you have your tumor. Uh, and you have those mutations, and maybe you check the blood at the same time, make sure you can identify them, and then you follow it over time. Because some patients maybe are going to have minimal residual disease. Now, that may help you decide, should you give maintenance, should you not give maintenance, right? What if they have no residual? Do they need maintenance at all? Um, but I need to be able to do something with that information. It has to be actionable. I kind of have a rule that don't order a test if you can't do anything with the information. Um, and so... Right now, I just don't know how to counsel patients. There are some patients that push for it. They want to know. Um, but, for example, back in the day for ovary cancer, we used to do these second look surgeries. And, well, we found disease all the time, but it didn't help people live longer. We just detected their disease sooner. So what I need is then effective strategies for maintenance or other things that are going to actually lead to improvements in both overall survival and quality of life. I don't want to just be diagnosing things and subjecting patients to more treatment, um, but not improving their outcomes. Any uh, trials out there, particularly larger trials, um, not necessarily looking at new agents, but um, in uh, ovarian cancer that you think uh, 
either from a you know research point of view or even you know patient care today point of view uh, you think are worth uh, note commenting on? Well, I'm very curious to see what the outcome of the first trial is going to be. That was an upfront trial um, where it's closed to enrollment, but patients got IO with chemotherapy. And there were several trials like this. And then they got um, nora- everybody got Norapur maintenance with or without IO. So I'm curious. That's a strategy um, that I'm curious about. Will IO work that way? It was a checkpoint inhibitor. Um, so that definitely are frontline uh, trials that have kind of complete enrollment, but we don't have results on, that's going to be very curious to me. Um, and I think we touched on some of the other big phase three trials uh, that are ongoing, Nemvolucan, Relicorlent. It's hard to make improvements in ovarian cancer. I am excited about, you know, p- the potential of taking some of these antibody drug conjugates and developing them and potentially replacing some of the doublet chemotherapies we use. Are we going to make a you know, forward impact that way? You know, I think we have lots of, of room to improve. Um, our, we have lots of unmet need. We really need to do something better about maintenance for those HRP patients up front. Uh, you know, those are patients that do not do well. Thank you very much. I learned a lot today. Really interesting. Sorry to hear about UPRI. I hope it comes back at some point. It must be really dis- terribly disappointing. It was. Um, you know, I was the national PI of uh, Uplift and the international PI of Up Next. So, yeah, I felt I've been treating patients since the first in human and, um, you know, was really hopeful about that drug. So we'll find out more to learn. This concludes our program. Special thanks to Dr. Richardson and thank you for listening. This is Dr. Neil Love for Oncology Today.